Good morning and welcome to worship at Boone's Creek Christian Church. Uh, I'm going to go through the number again, but pay attention because we're adding two extra things you could text this week. The number is 423-251-1200. Check in is what you need to text just to let us know you're here. If you want to use it to give, as many of you have learned so faithfully, just text the word give, follow the prompts. And if there's a decision you would want to make for Christ at the end of this service, just at that time, text the word prayer. Again, the number is 423-251-1200. Now, let me give you a couple of new numbers that we're going to be using or new words to text. The first one is June 7. One word, and you'll see it there in the screen, June 7. We have made the decision to our leaderships that we'll come back to church then. And there's going to be some protocol we'll follow. We'll have three services, 830, 945, and 11 o'clock, so we can still practice the safe distancing and follow our guidelines. So we need everyone who will to text to that number, June 7, and just follow the prompts and tell us which service you'll be at so we can make the proper plans uh, for how we're going to seat and take care of one another, June 7. The second one to text is the word VBS, or just the letters VBS. We're going to do a virtual vacation Bible school this year, the first week of June. And you can follow those prompts, and it'll be able to tell you what you need to do to pick up lessons, the things we'll be sending, and all. There'll be more news about that as we go along. But remember those two new ones, very important. June 7, uh, to let us know which service you'll be attending, and then VBS. Um, we look forward to worship today. Let's go into song at this point, following a word of prayer. God, we thank you that we can worship again today. And God, as we pray, God, we pray a thanksgiving to you for the importance of a day of worship. God, we praise you. We thank you. And God, on this day, we not only acknowledge worship of you, but we acknowledge it's a very special day that we remember our moms and what they've meant to us over the years and in our lives. God bless them this morning as they sit at homes with their families, with their children. God, as they are gathered with them to worship. God, it is a rejoicing thing, a real thing that we're together and we praise you for that in Christ's name. Be with us as we worship, we pray in his name. Amen. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring that. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want.
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Okay, we're going into the Word, but let me remind you of the number again because that's very important. Text the word June 7, one word, you see it on the screen, June 7 to 423-251-1200. What you're going to be asked to do then, let me take a minute to explain, is tell us how many from your family will be at what service on that day. Obviously, as we come back together, we'll have to do things a little bit different in our seating, and also we'll have three services to help us spread out in a safe distance. And those three services will be 830, 945, and 11. So please text June 7, follow the prompts, and let us know when you'll be coming to worship. Now, let's get into the Word of God, a very important time. I want to start with a question do you ever demand that Jesus perform for you? Now just think about that for a second. You'll see it there. Do you ever demand that Jesus perform for you? Or let me ask it another way. Do you treat Jesus as a waiter in a nice restaurant instead of treating him like the creator of the universe? Think about it for just a second. And I want to answer it real quick and simple by saying, he did not come to perform for us, but he came to reveal the truth about God, the consequences of sin, and the hope of salvation. We're going to be in the Gospel of John this morning, the sixth chapter. And I want to start at verse 25 where Jesus is revealing something very new about himself and he calls himself the bread of life. Now, why does he use this analogy? He had just fed the 5,000 a couple of days earlier, hours earlier, really. And they're all gathered around again. He had walked on the water. He had calmed the wind. And they've all gathered around again. And if I can be real honest with you, what they were doing, rather than looking at Jesus for who he was, they were looking at their bellies. What's he going to do for us next? I'll start with verse 25 and read through verse 26. It says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? They saw a boat leave and he wasn't in it, and now he's there. You know, he'd walked on the water. But they want to know, how'd you get here? And Jesus answered them. Listen what he says. Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. They're looking at Jesus to fill their bellies, not to cast faith upon him as the Son of God. Think of it this way, and maybe we understand more what they were doing for Jesus. Why is it so hard for a rich man to have friends? Because they... Never see the man, but they see his wealth. What will he do for me? What will he give me? How can I, if I hang around with him, maybe have a little of his fame or wealth rub off on me? And so often even find themselves despised, even though they may have a good heart. Jesus was reading the people's hearts. That's how they were treating him. Jesus, we're hungry again. Do something for us. And then in verse 29, we won't read all these verses for time, but verse 29, Jesus answered them, the work of God is this, you must believe in the one who he sent. Quit looking at your bellies, look at who Jesus is. And they still didn't get it, so listen to this. They asked him, what sign will you give us that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Think of that. Think of standing in front of Jesus, created by him, and the arrogance of sin that makes us say, what are you going to do for me right now, Jesus? Think about it. Many of you are old enough to remember the 
opera Jesus Christ Superstar that became very famous in the early 70s. And then more recent, it was performed live again on NBC TV a couple of times, back around Easter again, a new production of it. And it has a song in it where Herod is judging Jesus. Jesus is before Herod. Herod, who was created by God, by Christ, is now trying to pass judgment on him. And in, in the song, the way they wrote it, he says these things to him. Prove to me that you're divine. Change my water into wine. And that's all you need to do, then I'll know it's all true. Come on, you king of the Jews. And he continues and says, Jesus, you're not going to believe the hit you've made around here. So he fed the 5,000. So the writer of this song put it this way. You always talk about you're the wonder of the year. What a pity if it's all a lie. Still, I'm sure that you can rock the cynics if you tried. And then he says, so if you're the Christ, the great Jesus Christ, prove to me that you're no fool Walk across my swimming pool. That gives us the creeps to hear those words, doesn't it? it? Gives us the creeps. But how often are we just like that? I had a dying man tell me one time, and he was looking at death months out, but knew it was coming. And he asked a very sobering question out loud of himself. Why would Jesus hear any of my prayers now? when I've never prayed to him before. Now I want us to think about that this morning. Every time we get together, we talk about all that's going on in the world. We talk about the COVID. I, you know, we're going to learn to just hate that word over the next few months, I'm sure. And we see all it's doing to damage economies and everything, and it seems like we are all of a sudden falling on every bandwagon there is to prove it's this person's fault, that person's fault, one world government and everything. And then we start saying, Jesus, fix it, Jesus, fix it. Or maybe it's more personal and somebody in our family suddenly sick, and all of a sudden we say, if God's really who he said he was, they would heal mom or dad or child or grandma. Are we any different than Herod was in that song? Are the people who said, Jesus, what are you going to do for us? Listen what they said. It's very blunt. What will you do? You created us. You perform for us now. And then they go on and challenge him in verse 31 and says, Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness. We know that story, Jesus. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I'm hungry, Jesus. Do something for me. And then Jesus said in verse 32, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses. It wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it's the Father who gives you the true bread. That's huge, the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven, and that bread gives life to the world. It's about sin and its ugliness. It's about repentance. It's about the reality of hell. It's about having faith in Jesus as your creator and your savior, not faith in Jesus as your meal ticket and your check. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, listen to this in verse 35, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. His value will be guaranteed by the Holy Spirit living in him, that Jesus would say, or Paul would write, is a deposit from God himself. But as I've told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. I want to admit something to you because I think you'll identify with this. I used to think, especially early on in ministry, if only... If only I did better when I'd preach so I'd search for heart-rending stories where when I told them, people would go, oh, that's beautiful. And then I'd think if I just spoke better, if I just enunciated a little better, if I just became more articulate in the way I told the gospel, more people would listen. And then I would think 
This book will change them. Oh, please just read this book, whatever it is. Just read this author and your life will be changed. And I even gave books to people that I thought they can't read this and not be one to Christ. But then I read a scripture that awoke my spirit, permeated my mind and permeated my soul. And I read a fact of history that I can never deny. We'll share that with you in a minute. But I want you to ask yourself, have we lived thinking that if I do this, God has to do that? How often have we taught tithing as an investment that will give us more return? How often have we taught attendance to a church service as a guarantee of going to heaven? I'll do a little work, and then Jesus, you better perform and keep up your side of the deal. And I learned the Spirit of God comes to us in faith because of grace. I can't earn it. And for sure, I can't demand that Jesus perform for me. How sinful on my part. And I learned that the worst sermon spoken by a tired preacher filled with God's spirit will change a life. Yet it seems we still continue so often to look for God's truth in the spectacular rather in the simplicity that he is the only person who's ever been able to forgive my sin and set me free so that I no longer hunger and thirst for value and worthness in my life. Jesus is not going to perform for us. May God forgive us when we demand it. And we either choose to believe or we choose not to based on what he has shown us. Listen to what he said. Verse 35, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me, we go to him, not the other way around. And yet he says, you've seen me and don't believe. They started to grumble at this point. I'm hungry. I don't want your teaching. I want your food. I want your performance. I want your tricks. Walk on water. Walk across my swimming pool. Prove who you are, and then, then I'll follow you. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to allow it to cost me anything until I'll know I'll gain something. In verse 43, Jesus, knowing what they were saying, says, Stop grumbling among yourselves, he answered. No one can come to me. Listen to these sobering words if you're listening. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. In other words, God's the giver of life. We're not the creator of the show. And I will raise them up in the last days. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. And everyone who has heard the Father has learned from him and comes to me. Now, I want you to listen to some real important scripture this is meaty stuff. This is important stuff for us to learn. And it can convict us where we're sitting and listening today. But listen to this scripture from Acts 8. Real people living out real life. Simon the sorcerer saw the gift of the Holy Spirit given by the apostles in a spectacular way through a gift Jesus had given them. Remember they had committed to the fact Jesus was the Son of God. He wasn't performing for him. They would die for him. And it says when Simon, in Acts 8, 18, says when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on the apostles' hands, listen to what he did. Simon offered them money and said, I'm going to pay you. Give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands will receive the Holy Spirit. I'll give God money. And he'll perform for me. Peter answered. Very demonstratively. I won't say angry. But full of emotion. May your money perish with you Simon. 
because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money? You thought you could earn God's favor, Simon? May it all perish with you. And then he says, you have no part, you have no share. That's scary, isn't it? You have no share in the ministry of Christ because your heart is not right before God. Quit looking at what you can get and look at how you can die for him. And then he says in verse 22, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord, listen, in hope. Not in demanding, but in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. What was he telling Simon? Simon, you must be known by God, not the other way around. You can't demand of him. He demands of you. And then he closes what he says to him and says, I see you're full of bitterness and I see you're captive to sin. Jesus came to set us free. We can't demand all of this economic and material blessing from him. That's not what he came for. And then in our evangelistic lives, we're begging people when we should be petitioning God. Don't beg people, but ask God that he be revealed to them. What's all this sermon about? Let me make it very current. Some have maybe lost their jobs, and it's painful. Some businesses are struggling, extremely painful. People have been sick. People are worried about COVID, will it threaten them? On top of all the other issues we were dealing with. But I want you to hear something. I want you to hear it very well. God is in charge. Not you, not me. And that's freeing. Listen to it again. God is in charge. I'd love to tell this story to help us grasp it. It's an honor to be a minister to church. It's been here since 1825. And I want you to remember this. I've shared it with you before. We see the great divide in this country now, political divide. And people discover politics, and they start posting about it. And if this guy's not in office, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. If this one's not in office, listen, many years ago, people in this country were killing each other. Civil war. Tens of thousands of people were killing each other. And yet the church came together every week and shared in the body and the blood of Christ. There was a hundred years ago a tremendous depression, an economic downturn that put many people in food lines and, and we can't imagine the suffering that went on. There were no safety nets. There were no stimulus checks. And yet the church came together and worshiped the only one who give eternal life and hope, and that was Jesus. You can go through all the historical downturns, but Jesus is always in charge. What's the challenge of today's sermon? It says in verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, and died. I can feed your bellies, Jesus said, you'll still die. I can heal your sick, they'll still die. I can give you all sorts of economic wealth, you'll still die. But then he says, whoever comes to me and feeds on this bread, faith in him, obedience to him, you will live forever. Remember that. The only hope we have is in Christ. He said that while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. And he says it to us today. I've gotten to where I enjoy issuing this invitation. We had a baptism this week. 423-251-1200. And if you'd like to give your life to Christ or in any way commit fuller to him in a public way, Please text 
to that number, the word prayer, and just follow what it says. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. And God, forgive us for when we have demanded Jesus perform and allow us to totally walk away from that attitude. And Father, come to the attitude that he died once and it's our turn to die for him. God, forgive me and forgive us when we've treated him as the waiter in the restaurant instead of the creator of the universe. Father, we're overwhelmed by his love and his grace. And we're overwhelmed in the comfort of knowing that he is in charge. That there's no other cause to hang our hats on or to place our hearts behind. Thank you that he died for us. Thank you for the gift of eternal life that is made available. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
For our communion time this morning, we're going to continue with the scripture passage that David taught. We're going to start with verse 47, John chapter 6, verse 47. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus stunned the crowd, and he stunned his disciples that day. The ministry was just gaining traction. Many were following Jesus. As Jesus was becoming more popular, his followers were becoming excited about being a part of this new movement, gaining the momentum that would lead to freedom from the Roman oppression. Then Jesus surprises everyone by telling them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. It was crazy talk. It made no sense, and for many, the party was over. The viral popularity ended, and a great number of Jesus' followers left that day, never understanding the true meaning of Jesus' words. Rumors that the early Christians practiced cannibalism were common because of this misunderstanding. As we look back, we can see that Jesus was speaking figuratively. In talking of the eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood, Jesus was actually looking forward. He was looking forward to the time of the last Passover meal when he would share this with his closest followers. He was looking forward to the night that he would tell us as well to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Eating the bread and drinking the cup, it's quite a remarkable act. If you don't understand the whole story of what it took to accomplish the forgiveness of your sins, it makes no sense at all. It's crazy talk. But if you do understand what Jesus did for you, it means everything. This is the act that sets you apart every time you do it as a believer in Jesus Christ. If you eat the bread and you drink the cup in remembrance of him, there can be no mistake. You are truly a follower of Christ. Every time we take of the bread, his body, and of the cup, his blood, we spiritually feed on Jesus. We remember him. We talk to him. We commune with him. And as Jesus has said, we live an abundant, eternal life because of him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, as we come this morning to partake of the bread, Christ's broken body, and the cup, his shed blood, we come this morning to do this remarkable act in remembrance of Jesus, in remembrance of his remarkable giving of himself for us on the cross. We come this morning as believers and as followers of Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen.
let us partake of the bread, Christ's body given for us. And let's take of the cup, Christ's blood shed for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun. Thank you all for being a part of worship today at Boone's Creek Christian Church. Uh, don't, don't leave yet. Listen, uh, a couple of things. 423-251-1200, June 7. Very important, June 7. Uh, let us know that you'll be coming to worship. And also, VBS to the same number. Text it, 
251-1200, and you'll begin to get information how that's going to work. Uh, stick around in just a few minutes. Uh, Heath Schnelly, the Minister of Education, Adult Education here, will be teaching a Sunday school lesson, a lot to learn, a lot to help you grow closer to Christ. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you for the worship we've had today, the joy of coming around the table again, Father, the learning we've been able to do from your scripture, the praises that have been sung. And God, be with us through this coming week. God, we look forward to June the 7th when we can come together again and see each other. Thank you, Father, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our place. Sending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord.